Welcome to Pure Passion. My name is David Kyle Foster and I'm your host for today's program. It would be safe to say that there are a great many people in the world today who've been deeply wounded or traumatized by events in their life. In fact, the majority of people living today probably have at least one area that could use some significant emotional or psychological healing. One of the most exciting means for acquiring that healing can be found by seeking God's supernatural help through inner healing prayer or the healing of memories. Our guest today is Dr. Francis McNutt, who is one of the pioneers of this form of healing prayer. His best-selling books have populated the shelves of bookstores for decades now. Dr. McNutt was for many years a Roman Catholic priest before falling in love and marrying his wife Judith, who also ministers with him at their offices in Jacksonville, Florida. I sat down with Francis some time ago and asked him to share a bit of the wisdom that he has accumulated over the years in ministering to broken people. Listen carefully, because I believe that God has something vital to teach us through the life of Francis McNutt. Well, inner healing is simply, uh, as I see it, God heals a human being, a person, on any area where they're sick. I mean, that's why he came, is to renew us and give us new life. And the, the, the different areas of our humanity that can be really wounded or, or die. Uh, one of them, of course, we know our bodies get sick and they wither up and die. Uh, there can be demonic interference on occasion and that needs to be dealt with. But inner healing is simply uh, the area of our emotions, uh, what's inside us. Not just I have a broken bone, but I have a broken heart. And so it makes sense if we're talking about healing human beings that this is that particular area of humanity where many people are really wounded. And we find uh, in experience that God uh, heals more people actually on the inner order uh, percentage-wise than he seems to heal in the physical order. And uh, well, just for instance, uh, a large percentage of women in our society are sexually abused. The, the lowest estimate of young women is 20% or maybe 30%, and that leaves a permanent impre impress. And you don't get over it by repentance. I mean, it was somebody else that did this to you. And say, here's a 40-year-old woman who can't relate physically with her husband. It's not her fault. But is there healing for this? And we've discovered every area of our human lives where we're wounded or being destroyed, God has a power to do something about it and to help us. As I see it, see, there, there are two elements in most sin. One is where the person makes a decision, I'm going to do this. I know it's wrong, but I'm going to do it. That's what sin is. But there are also these other elements that, uh, that cloud the vision, that make a person see something as good when it isn't. Uh, also the impulse to do something and you know it's wrong and there's an impulse in the person and it still moves the person in that direction. So in most sin, there's something, of culpability, but a large amount of sin, there's also this element of, uh, of not willing. I, I, as St. Augustine said, I, I do the things I hate doing. Paul said that. I don't understand my own behavior. I do the very things I hate and the things I want to do, I fail to do and I don't understand myself. That's a paraphrase of Romans 7. So this is a, um, I think people tend to get very harsh on people and they don't understand this element of, uh, of the non-voluntary where they need healing perhaps. Maybe 90% of what they do is uh, impulsive and uh, somebody's high on drugs and so on. and then when they come to in the morning they find what they've done they've killed somebody and they didn't mean to do it really and if they're better selves they they realize they wouldn't have done it and so that's why Jesus came because we're not purely that the law is here it is do it or don't do it and the reason Jesus came is that that's not enough. The law doesn't get us there. We need grace. We need help. But we have our human nature to contend with. Like, say, sexual sin, there's attractiveness 
to it and there's some payoff. But there's also this other element. And like uh, say in pornography frequently, there's a demonic element. And if a person's in this long enough, there's an, it's in the pathways of the, of the mind. There's a habit built up over the years that makes it very, very strong. So that somebody's been in porn pornography over a period of time, it's very hard for the person to shape up. And sometimes there's a demonic element pro propelling the person, increasing what's already there in our human nature. It's often said that uh, homosexuality is a tie to wounds of the past. And there, there are a variety. Each person is different. And it's a mistake to say every, all of it is caused by this or by this. But a, a lot of homosexuality is caused by a man seeking the love of another man. And when we're young, we really need the love of our fathers uh, to affirm us as men, uh, to make us want to be men, and so forth. And if this young man doesn't receive the love of his father, it may not be the father's fault. The father may just be absent. He may be in the military, and he just doesn't come home. He's over in Iraq for a year. All of those things, and uh, so he, he needs this, humanly speaking, growing up. It's not sexual per se, it's the need for intimacy and affirmation. And if he doesn't receive this, and an older man who is homosexual in orientation and acts on it in a sexual way, may see this uh, young man standing in the corner, as it were, uh, feeling left out, uh, not part of the group, maybe not very athletic or whatever it is that um, makes him feel like a young man, like a real man, you know, like plays football with a broken ankle and plays anyway, all of that. And he, he's not that type, especially artistic types. And here, here's an older man who understands this and uh, he befriends this young man and sexualizes it eventually. And so it gets a sexual component, a physically sexual component, where it's acted out. And then it becomes a habit pattern, perhaps. And the, the people who understand him and his loneliness often are people in the sexual community, the homosexual uh, lifestyle. And they understand this and uh, become sexualized physically. Um, men in the church who are healthy sexually uh, should be able to be friends to the younger generation in a healthy sense. And in the human order, help fill that in, like an elder brother, father figure. It's not primarily a sexual need, a uh, physically sexual need, but it's an emotional need. And the emotional need is built in by God in a human being's nature. And I, I think probably the reason there are fewer women, lesbians, in this is that women tend to be closer, I think, to their children than, than men do. And the, the need of young girls is more readily, more often fulfilled. And so the lesbian population is uh, smaller in comparison to the male homosexual population. The first thing you deal with is not the, uh, the physical sex. That, that's not the part. You, you look for what is it that the person is really seeking. And in every sin, there's something positive the person's seeking. And then there's something negative, which is destructive. And the important thing is to find out what is the positive drive in this? What are they looking for that God would want to fulfill? Because he's put that desire um, for male companionship and for a father. He's put that in us, and that needs to be fulfilled in us. And in our society, often is not fulfilled. Uh, the, the father is absent. He, uh, he's probably a loving father trying to make ends meet with two jobs. And when I put food on the table for my family, I love them. So but the son doesn't feel it. I find, now I'm 80 years old, and I find that uh, often we misperceive other people's uh, motivations. Uh, they do something, and you, you think that they did it out of malice or whatever. I, 
I find that's common in human nature, that uh, we, we tend to see the negative more easily than we see the positive. If you haven't bonded with your dad and he's passed away, uh, what we find, and this is amazing, that at some point uh, in the prayer, you can bring it sounds, you know, for people who haven't experienced this, like as pie in the sky, but it isn't. But uh, I often pray that Jesus, through his risen humanity, which includes he was a human being like us in everything except sin, and that Jesus in his humanity can restore uh, to this man something in his humanity that was missing. And we find in prayer that often we let Jesus take over the prayer that often uh, amazing things take place, like uh, suddenly he's a young man again uh, in his teens, and Jesus appears and takes him fishing, and they go fishing. Now, you don't think of you know, making up a prayer, asking Jesus to go fishing with this 40-year-old man, but these, these things happen. Jesus has a deep uh, love of our humanity and who we are as human beings. Uh, sometimes God the Father appears. This is another, you know, how, how does God the Father appear? It's a, because he, he's not an old man with a beard. But uh, the presence of God as Father, not you know, picture, pictorial, it, it sometimes happens. It's just amazing what God can do. Now, it often takes a, a period of time. It often doesn't happen at once. And I, I would estimate, ideally, that it may take six months, and it's different for each person. And you don't start with the sexual thing, usually, just saying no. And uh, I've seen this happen where the person, as they're being healed, maybe they're in a relationship, a sexual relationship, and have been for a long time. And there's a lot of good in it, you, and uh, evil. You know, it's, it's, Most of our lives, there's a mixture, and we want to get the good totally. <laughs> And the person says, well, I can't really leave the other person yet because it would destroy them. Or they'll say something like that. And then maybe a month later, the person in the dream would get the word that they should leave, and they find that the other person's gotten that too. And this peacefully, they, they part company. The first 300 years of Christianity, everybody prayed for healing and deliverance. Everyone prayed. It was not restricted, and they expected it to happen for the first 350 years. Then it gradually died out um, for good reasons, and uh, through very good people it happened, which is the amazing thing, until you know, the Middle Ages, uh, healing still went on in the Catholic Church in the Middle Ages but it was only through saints. And if, if you were a saint, you didn't know it, and you certainly never claimed to be a saint, so you'd never pray for healing, because people would think you more than you are. So nobody would presume to do this. And then John Calvin later decided that uh, healing was a Catholic superstition, so he pretty well cut it out altogether. So you get the idea that it ceased. But it goes back to a, a recognition of the divine right of kings. You know, a lot of people will say to me, I'm uncomfortable with the idea of God as my father. Well, I can completely identify with that feeling. You see, the enemy of our souls has sown this attitude into our hearts from the mistreatment or neglect that we suffered from our earthly fathers or other authority figures. Satan doesn't want us to know the beauty and mercy of God the Father. So he's put the thought into our mind that God is like our earthly father. Not so. God the Father is perfect. He's perfect in all of his ways, the scripture tells us. Incapable of error. Incapable of sin. Incapable of failing us or hating us or forsaking us. It is not in him to even consider such things. The Bible says this, is not the Lord your Father, your Creator, who made you and formed you, a Father to the fatherless, a defender of widows? But you, O Lord, are our Father. Our Redeemer from of old is your name. One God and Father of all, 
who is over all and through all and in all. I will be a father to you and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Almighty. And since you are a son, God has made you also an heir. I had a difficult time being comfortable with the idea that God was my father because I hated my father. Until I got saved at the age of 29, he was the person I most despised on this earth. He was also a preacher. So you can see that I had some difficulty with the idea of loving God the Father. But when Jesus saved me, everything changed. And before it was over, my earthly father went from being the man I most hated to the man I most loved. You see, when I received grace and mercy, I was enabled to release grace and mercy. Having my spiritual eyes opened gave me the necessary perspective. As God declared in my spirit, you are my son, I was enabled to shift my focus from my own need for approval to simply doing God's will from a grateful heart. You see, when the Father reveals his unconditional love to those who seek him, people are freed to forsake their rebellion and to embrace obedient sonship. God no longer looms in their imaginations as someone who is out to get them, from whom they must protect themselves. They enter a place of security with the Father's unconditional love. So you see, there is no need to fear coming to God the Father. He has a ring for you. He has a royal robe to put around you and a feast to celebrate your being part of his family. Christ has provided all of that for us. Well, this is a fascinating thing I learned many years ago from my dear friend Tommy Tyson, who was a Methodist evangelist. And he was asked, what's wrong with uh, sexual relations before marriage? And he said, when two people get together in a physical way, that there's a spiritual bond that's set up. And you get that in Paul. He talks about don't... Uh, get a prostitute, you know, because that, there's a confusion there. And so there's a real spiritual bond set up when somebody has a physical relationship with someone else. And that somehow needs to be broken. And the way Tommy uh, put it, like uh, somebody who's young and a heterosexual relationship, when you enter marriage, uh, there are six other people, say, who are entering into the marriage with you, as it were, in the marriage bed. And I remember, he always would pray for people before they're married that they be cut free from all these other relationships. So there's a mysterious spiritual relationship uh, which is consummated in the physical rela relationship. It needs to be severed. Now, it's probably not very deep, and there may be 500 relationships like that that need to be set free and cut free. But at some point along the line, it's not necessarily demonic. It's just like there's a relationship there that shouldn't be there. And uh, it'll always be there in your memory, at least. And the person needs to be set free. Soul ties is another word for it. I remember Dennis Mennett, part of his uh, testimony, he was the first Episcopal priest that we know of to be baptized in the Spirit in 1959. Part of his testimony was, uh, in his dreams, he used to have terrible temptations in, in his dreams. After he was baptized in the Spirit, all those uh, lifted off and disappeared. Now, that doesn't always happen, but that's wonderful. It's something that God can do. And uh, so we pray that people be set free at some point when they're ready for it, when they can accept it. See, I want that. It happens in all kinds of different ways. And when Jesus does appear to people, sometimes it's as simple as getting an ice cream cone and taking the kid out you know, to have ice cream. Or I mentioned you know, going fishing or some simple thing like that. I find he, he, like he, when he was alive in this world, he gave parables, which are stories. And the stories have a power. And uh, Jesus often, often uh, I'm not saying it always happens, but he, he says something or uh, 
he takes the person in his arms and holds the person, who need, the little boy or the girl, who needs to cry. It's just amazing what can happen. When Jesus says, I love you, it's like creation. No, God said, let there be light. It, you know, his words are a lot stronger than ours because they're creative. They can create what he says. Uh, ours are helpful, but they don't create. But his can create if he says that. Uh, I'd say the first thing to do is to be informed. Like uh, David Kyle Foster has written a book on sexual brokenness. Uh, Alan Menninger has written uh, several books on uh, the process. Uh, I like his books because it deals with the process. Because uh, now I've, I've known people who are instantly healed. Uh, and uh, that's, that's wonderful. But most of it is a process. So it's good to find a counselor who believes in this, who can help unearth. What counselors do is not so much heal, it's to unearth where all this came from. And so if there's a Christian counselor, especially if they also believe in prayer, uh, they can be a tremendous help. And then there are various groups, like Exodus International as a group, or Regeneration, Desert Stream, there are groups that have chapters in almost every major city. So you can meet people who understand, who have been going through this process. So I think the first thing is to become informed. The second is to find other people who would understand this, who can help you. It's something like um, Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, alcoholics found out, and it's very Christian, really. First of all, you have to admit you need help. That's, that's where you start. I, I, I can't. The second is, I can't do it myself. I, I need help. And uh, one is to turn to the power higher, which of course is God, but also you need a sponsor. You need help from somebody like you, uh, who's been an alcoholic often, who understands what you're going through, and you can call them any hour of the day or night, all of that kind of thing, who is willing to partner you through this hard time. So those are the things you can do. Become informed. Find a friend, find a counselor, find a group. The first thing is to read. Sometimes they get a distorted view of, uh, of God from reading the Bible, the, the portions of the Bible that seem, you know, God coming down hard on sinners. And I think it's important uh, to read something about the life of Jesus. Uh, I have some favorite authors. I like Philip Yancey, What's So Amazing About Grace, and The Jesus I Never Knew, a friend, uh, Brennan Manning, who wrote the Ragamuffin Gospel, and uh, he's very strong on people who don't know the love of God and the forgiveness that's in God. I, I would start them reading something like that to see, first of all, change their attitude towards God, and then hopefully put them in touch with someone in the church. Uh, uh, whether it's a layperson or a pastor, somebody who, who is loving and uh, accepting, not of sinful behavior, but of, 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 of the person like Jesus was. The whole story of the prodigal son, uh, it's an amazing story. I, I didn't come for the righteous, I came for sinners, is the word of Jesus. Yes, every, everyone. God loves everyone. He created everyone. Now things go wrong. You know? He doesn't love the sin, but he loves the sinner. That's the way it's always been phrased. You know, We're supposed to do that too. We hate the sin, love the sinner. But most people tip off on, it's very hard to maintain that balance. If you really hate sin, you're going to hate sinners. That's the general way it works. On the other hand, if you really love people, you're going to be inclusive and bring them in. And uh, there's a, a narrow line there, you know, and I think only God can really help us walk that line. What a treasure God has given the body of Christ in Francis McNutt, and such wisdom and balance. I have benefited personally from reading his books and attending his conferences, so I hope that you will take advantage as well of the great deposit of wisdom that he has given us. God wants to heal you deep inside 
and he wants to turn your tragedies into triumphs. He wants to turn the evil that was done to you into something that will bring benefit and blessing to you. Don't ever be afraid to take your deepest hurts to him for his miraculous, transforming, and healing touch. Until next week, this is David Kyle Foster for Pure Passion, bidding you a blessed day. Following